Hello, everyone. Hope you all are doing well and staying safe. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for our webinar on concept development in IR with Dr. Shukla. It's an honor to have him talk to us today, but before we get started, I just want to share a little bit about what the Biodesign and Innovation Committee is currently working on. So as you know, as you may know, tonight's webinar is the third of a five-part Biodesign webinar series where speakers will be talking more about the different steps in the biodesign process from identifying a clinical need and developing a concept to entrepreneurship and bringing this idea to market. One initiative we are running in conjunction with this webinar series is a survey to assess the, its impact on medical student education and understanding of the biodesign process. We'd appreciate it if you could fill out the short survey if you haven't received it already from Hassan earlier today. If not, you can scan the QR code. And thank you so much for helping us with this initiative. So this webinar series also runs in conjunction with our committee's flagship project, the Biodesign Competition. Our theme this year is innovation in the era of COVID-19. We invite teams of medical students, undergraduates, and other graduate students to tackle these challenges and clinical needs that IR physicians face during this pandemic. You can scan the QR code found on this page to sign up for the competition or simply learn more about what the competition is all about. This webinar series is designed to run alongside the competition and provide teams with practical information about the biodesign process. All right, that's our quick plug for our committee's work. Um, now I'll um, lend it off to Sakshan to introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you, Deepak. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Sakshan. I'm currently the chair of the uh, SIR Medical Student Biodesign Innovation Committee. Um, and I wanted to introduce Dr. Shukla, who will be talking today about concept development. I've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Shukla for the past three, year, three years. He's acted as a great mentor to me, and he has a lot of experience about in uh, biodesign, specifically within IR. He has experience launch, launching a medical device modification startup during his training and was able to bring the device from, concept, from a concept in his mind all the way to putting it onto the shelf. I think that we could all learn a lot from Dr. Shukla's expertise, and it's my honor to hand over the reins to him to begin our talk. Oh, thanks, Sakshan, for the kind introduction. Good evening, everybody. My name is Deep Shukla. I'm assistant professor of radiology at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School, um, well, principally based out of University Hospital of Newark. Um, like Suction mentioned, uh, my journey to medical device development uh, was started during my training. And throughout the, my talk today, I'll kind of give you some anecdotes of my story and how there um, was just a bunch of friends sort of hanging around uh, during residency around the dinner table, um, came up with an idea, uh, acted upon it, and then now have a device uh, that we work in conjunction with a medium-sized medical device company on the shelf. Um, that we actually use, I used it uh, today. The um, premise for my talk is uh, sort of a beginner's guide. It's a one-on-one -on -one talk. Um, we're not, uh, you know, anyone on this uh, webinar uh, today. Principal goal is to be, you know, an, an interventional radiologist, whether academic or private practice. Um, if you want to be a big-time medical device development engineer, you would have a different pathway. Um, or if you want to lead a big device company, you'd also have a different pathway as well. So I kind of wanted to give you guys an overview of how, uh, because interventional radiology is sort of uh, very techno uh, technology dependent, um, how you know we can integrate our skills and be of value to the industry and the medical device um, world. Um, these are my disclosures. So like I said, uh, why, you know, why is interventional radiology uh, one of the specialties where medical devices have really, you know, continued to grow and continue to uh, advance and continue to uh, uh, come out with new products, you know, almost uh, every year. Well, compared to our surgical counterparts, our procedures are minimally invasive. 
Um, we tend to make things, um, you know, prevent big scars and big operations um, with high risk and try to do things that are that are done through a pinhole, you know, either through one of the uh, arteries or veins or percutaneously into different organs um, to, you know, prevent the morbidity um, that you can get with big surgeries. Interventional radiology is a problem solving specialty. So um, I'm so sure Suction knows and all the uh, medical students on this webinar today know, you know, when you're on your interventional radiology rotation, um, many specialties, many subspecialties um, and different services will come down to IR to ask, you know, hey, this is a clinical scenario we have. Can you guys do something here? Can you guys uh, help us out somehow? This patient is bleeding, you know, is there anything you can do? Um, there's clot here. Um, are you guys able to take this out? And just because our specialty is so versatile and we're not um, tied to one organ system, you know, we're typically able to help out all the other specialties. Um, every day there's new problems, new treatments, new techniques, and this all converts to new, new devices. And because of these reasons, interventional radiology is really at the forefront of technology. Um, I, I couldn't can't give this talk without you know mentioning some of the pioneers um, in interventional radiology and device development. Um, on the left uh, image in this, on my screen here, um, I'm sure all you guys are all familiar with this Dr. Dotter. He is considered the father of interventional radiology. Um, he was um, the pioneer of the cardiac cath, lower extremity angiography, and did one of the first angioplasties um, ever to be done in the world. And so the image on the right is a good friend of Dr. Daughter, who is uh, Bill Cook. Bill Cook is the founder and was the um, CEO and chairman of Cook Medical, one of the biggest uh, medical device com companies in the world. Um, these two met together at RSNA when minimally invasive procedures such as angiography um, were getting started, and um, Dr. Daughter went up to Cook's booth at RSNA, um, asked him for a couple of catheters, um, asked him if he could borrow them, took them up to his room, modified them. And the story, as the story goes, uh, in one week, they came up with a whole line of diagnostic catheters. Um, pretty interesting story about Dr. Dotter. He was definitely a pioneer um, and a risk taker. Um, he was one of the first uh, people, like I said, to sort of really perfect cardiac catheterization to measure pressures and in all the ventricles and to get pulmonary artery pressures for different disease states. There's a famous um, lecture that he gave to cardiology and radiology residents where he had a, a screen that showed the waveforms in the, um, in the heart, live waveforms, and then he rolls up his sleeve and the catheter was actually in his brachial artery. The, the tip of the catheter was in his heart. Um, so these two gentlemen sort of are, uh, in my mind, um, the pioneers of uh, uh, medical device, both from the interventional side and from the uh, medical device clinic side. Um, all, you know, everyone that's interested in device development, you can, um, you know, Google medical device development, and you're going to get lots of images that look like this. I got to tell you, this is not what I'm talking about today. As I said when I started my talk, I'm not trying to show you how to Baker Cook Industries or Boston Scientific or anything like that. These phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four studies, if you're interested in that, um, that's a sort of a different pathway um, and it requires a, a large team of people, you know, hundreds if not thousands of people. Um, but when you're just getting into medical device development, this is not a paradigm that you should follow. This is too complicated, too um, time consuming. Uh, you can't be an, an expert in everything, including regulations. Um, animal testing and all that kind of stuff. It's not what I'm talking about. I do have to give a plug to some, uh, for some resources that I use in my journey. This book for anyone who is interested in medical device development or in interventional radiology devices, even if you, you know, don't uh, want to create devices or be involved in that, um, this is a book that anyone that is interested in technology should get and should read. I kind of read it cover to cover when I was in training um, after my journey had started. It's, uh, it's titled Biodesign, um, and it's from the Biodesign program at Stanford. So there are some universities that have Biodesign uh, fellowships. Stanford has um, so 
the, the most popular and the best biodesign fellowship, which consists of three one three different parts. One third of the fellows are doctors, most some of which are interventional radiologists, cardiologists, vascular surgeons in the endovascular space. One third are engineers, and one third are the business folks. Sort of the three uh, areas you need to you know um, develop devices. This book goes um, through everything from um, that I'm going to talk to you about today, start to finish on how to take a, an idea to or a concept to an actual device. Um, so this is, a, this is a good book to get and a good resource to have if you don't want to get into the space. For anyone that wants to do the fellowship, you could do it before or after IR fellowship. Now IR is a residency, so it'll probably be IR after the residency. Um, most people that do the fellowship do end up working for industry medical device companies. Again, my goal and my, what I'm going to talk to you about today is how to be a physician involved in medical device. I would still give a plug for reading this book because um, if you guys are, you know, heavily involved in high-level IR, whether private practice or academics, you will be, your life will intertwine with device companies, device reps, and um, if you do, you know, want to have a fulfilling academic career or even private practice career, um, you may have, you know, consulting agreements and different relationships with device companies to help them help us treat patients. This is just sort of an overview of my talk. Uh, one more, um, so this is again, sort of uh, what I'm gonna be talking about today, but it's the uh, timeline that the biodesign uh, book and the Stanford Fellowship sort of follow, where you have to first, you know, identify what's called an unmet need, um, that's essentially coming up with the idea. Then you have to invent um, the solution to the unmet need, and that's sort of figuring out the concept. What, what's the, what is the solution to the problem that we've identified and how can we fix it? And then the third part, which is sort of um, usually not in the hands of physicians, which is how do we implement this? How do we actually develop the, the device? How do we get somebody else to develop the device? How can I um, work with somebody else to develop the device and at the end of the day, get it on the shelf and in the hands of doctors? So the idea, um, this is sort of the most important part, I would say, of um, biodesign. And there's sort of two ways that ideas come about. And I'm more in favor of the organic way. That's sort of, that's the way that my um, journey had started and how my company came about. And it's sort of that aha moment. And it usually happens when you have a problem, when you have a, a diagnostic or therapeutic dilemma. Like I said, pretty much radiology is a field where we're problem solving. All the services come to us with some problem in the same way. We're problem solvers during procedures. Um, there's no textbook to how uh, a recanalization is done or how an occluded artery is crossed or uh, many different things. So. The reason I like like this organic development of the idea is my last uh, bullet point there, where when I was a student and, and, and a resident in radiology, I used to always hear my attendings say, I wish there was blah, 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 a way to do this. I wish there was a device that did this. I wish there was a wire that could get me into this artery. I wish there was a catheter that was stiff on this end, but soft on the other end. They never really acted upon. The other thing that I began to notice was when a new device comes out, doctors would be um, sort of consulted off the record with by the medical device reps and they would provide a lot of feedback. Anyone that used the device more frequently or was very involved in um, making modifications of the device or trying to make, work out the kinks when a device first came, came out would be consultants. However, this, sometimes this requires a lot of time a lot of investment, a lot of time. Usually it's with speaker gigs, traveling around, telling everyone your data. But I never saw doctors really getting involved in the development part of the, part of the um, picture. And I just always heard different doctors saying, you know, I wish there was this, I wish there was that, but no one really acted upon it. The other sort of way an idea comes about is sort of forced idea. This is like an actively brainstorming um, uh, sort of practice that lots of big medical device companies do. 
this is also a very good way to come up with ideas, but I don't think uh, as physicians it's a very um, productive and very um, efficient way to come up with ideas. Um, big medical device companies have lots of money, lots of resources, lots of staff, staff including engineers, doctors, and consultants in various different fields. So for them, they have to keep innovating at a much higher level with many, many different products. So um, what they will do is they'll have a hundred different ideas on a, on a sort of a think board, idea board. And then they will prioritize the ideas based on feasibility, um, profitability, unfortunately, and usability of the product. How necessary is the idea? Does it really treat them that need? At the end of the day, how many of these are we going to sell, and what uh, what's the risk? That's you know, important on a different scale because these companies have to stay afloat. They need money for R and D to pay their employees and to keep growing, um, and uh, you know keep the investors happy. But that's not what my experience has been in the idea development. Now the unmet need. This is sort of uh, probably the most important slide. If you guys get anything from this talk, this is the um, uh, sort of the most critical thing that you need to understand is that most difficult thing to do in device development is to identify whether the problem that you have seen is actually a problem. Is this unmet need an unmet need? Um, lots of people come up with lots of different ideas. I'll get to the patent part in a second. There's, thousands, there's millions and millions of patents out there, but not that many devices. So the unmet need is a very, very hard question to answer. Um, but it is something that you have to vet out once you come up with an idea. Because if you don't do this part appropriately, then doing everything else is sort of a waste of time. One way to go about answering whether or not a clinical problem is an unmet need is to ask other people if they've also noticed a similar problem. Um, and then, you know, have there been attempts to address this problem in the past? Have other people already tried to fix this problem? Are there solutions that exist, but I don't know about them? Are there solutions that exist, but the devices don't exist? Why don't the devices exist? Um, are there patents out there that are similar to the idea that I have? Why did these patents never get manufactured? Why did they never get, why did the idea never come to the shelf? All kinds of things you have to kind of perseverate about separating um, sort of practice that will really answer the question of whether you've identified an unmet need. After you identify the unmet need or you do, you know, you convince yourself that you really defined a problem, um, you have to make sure that the solution doesn't exist. And the solution being the idea that you may have or an alternate solution, which may or may not be better than the idea that you have, even if it's not better than the idea you have, um, it may control the market. There may be a bunch of ideas, including the idea you have, but none of them have been maybe on the market. It's also a problem because that may that shows you that there may not be the need for a particular solution that you've identified. With that said, the other reason to do a patent search is um, if you do get to the development phase and there's even something that's sort of similar to yours, it kind of gets into a very gray space um, and uh, legal space and Kind of don't want to put um, put yourself in that situation for doing a lot of work and then um, not being able to claim uh, credit for the work you did or be able to move forward with the work you did because something already exists. For anyone that's starting out, I mean, Google uh, Patents is an incredibly good resource. Um, you can search anything on Google Patents, and I would say about 90% of patents that are filed and published are on Google Patents. If you file a provisional patent and your patent uh, and you never act on it or never file for a utility after one year, those also get published um, because then they become open to the general public. Um, you lose your um, hold on the provisional patent. Um, and these also are published on Google Patents. 10% of patents are uh, only accessible to patent lawyers. And these are from usually from really big companies, not usually medical device but they're protected by, uh, by the patent office because these companies have paid big, big fees to protect these patents because they want to act on the patent and they want to modify their own patents to sort of keep 
their um, intellectual property within their company. Um, but I would say uh, patent lawyers do have access to databases that have the full, um, you know, 100% of all patents that are filed. However, um, using a patent lawyer can become very, 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 very expensive. Um, every time they do a search, they can charge you lots and lots of money. So I would say, you know, do the um, search with the Google patents um, because you will get a lot of different um, results that will show you, you know, if your idea is there or not. And the example I have here is an IPC filter. The other, the other reason I have this um, sort of Google patents uh, clip on this page is you can see there's about almost 31,000 results. So if you've had an idea, there may be a patent that describes your idea, but even if there's like a little modification, sometimes you can get a patent issued. So like, even though I said before, you know, if something already exists, don't get discouraged. Just make sure you do your due diligence and find out whether or not your idea is actually something that's patentable and protected. So how, how do you, you know, how do we write a patent now? If you look at the words on the screen now, um, the patent is, um, it's, it's, it's that pretty long. Um, they can be, you know, pages and pages and pages long. They're very, very technical. Um, a lot of times they can be um, very mathematical and have a lot of physics involved, especially with torque and things like that. Um, they're very descriptive. You want to be extremely descriptive in your patent because you want to make sure that your idea is definitely protected, but at the same time be general because you want to make sure that your concept is also protected. This patent is, of course, written by a patent lawyer, which costs you anywhere from ten to fifty thousand dollars to get. Um, and this is a utility patent, so this patent to actually get it issued would cost you know thousands of dollars as well. This is not the provisional patent that you have to file originally to protect your idea. If you saw here on, in the middle of the screen, there's about twelve figures that are um, alluded to in the patent. And this is what the figures look like. Again, getting figures drawn by um, a, a patent il illustrator or patent artist can become very, very, very expensive. This is one IVC filter. And if you look at figure seven, um, you can see the number 252. So they've detailed the images um, to have 252 parts. So you have they try to be as detailed as they can to sort of convey their idea, but you want to make sure that you're as detailed as you can be because, um, like I said, a small modification, if a small modification is made and not described in your utility patent, then someone else can come and um, make that modification and sort of, for lack of better, better terms, steal your idea. Again, these are very, uh, can be very expensive to get. Um, and we actually, my, my group actually, we did our own patent filing in our own um, drawings, and I'll get to that in a bit. So this is the second um, plug that I want to give. It's another book that was referenced in the biodesign book. The biodesign book does have a good section on provisional patents, but me and my group had actually bought this book as well. It's called Patent It Yourself. This book is uh, not one that you read cover to cover, but you kind of um, can read the sections on how to file a provisional patent and how detailed your provisional patent has to be. A provisional patent, so the difference between a provisional patent and a utility patent, patent is the following. A provisional patent is something that protects your idea for one year for you to act upon your idea. So let's say I get an idea today um, for even a paperclip. Paper, and I do a patent search and paperclips don't exist. I have to essentially write, up, uh, write out a patent and file it with the patent office for less than $200 which protects my idea for one year, lets me act on this idea. Does that mean a provisional patent can be very short and not detailed? Absolutely not, because what's protected in your provisional patent, uh, what's in your provisional patent is, is the only thing that is protected. So one piece of advice that we got in our journey from people that we had spoken to that sort of went through this process was to make the provisional patent very detailed. A lot of people just file the provision, refile the provisional as a utility patent once they do their prototyping and modeling and thinking for the year. Um, but it doesn't have to be exactly the same. This sort of protects your idea for a year and in which time you have to actually either hire a lawyer or 
write the utility patent yourself and to get the updated drawings uh, from our the patent illustrator. The utility patent is the extensively long patent that um, it's very detailed, lots of figures um, that gets filed with the patent office. And when that gets issued, um, you actually own the intellectual property. So if you guys all watch Shark Tank, I'm sure you've heard that, uh, you know, they always say, oh, yeah, our idea is patent pending. So that actually doesn't mean anything. Um, I know that the, the TV show sort of glorifies it. Oh, you have a patent, you know, you apply for a patent, you're patent pending. That's great. That just means they filed it a provisional patent that doesn't mean anything that does not mean that they will get the utility patent um, issued to them in in the way we my company did it we came up with their idea we went around asked a bunch of folks if the idea was good and we wrote the provisional patent ourselves but we let the medical device company take our patent and file the utility patents and do the uh, the very detailed drawings um, and descriptions. So right be before our provisional patent expired, they refiled the provisional patent and then with their language and refiled it and then filed for the utility. Again, provisional patent holds your idea for uh, in place for a year, but has to be very thorough. And a utility patent, you should file within one year of your provisional patent filing, um, but you don't want to ask so you don't want to add too much information to the provisional patent. Um, and like I said, a patent lawyer can be of value, but it can cost up to $50,000, all inclusive to get your patent filed. After your patent gets filed, it goes to the patent office. You make claims in your file. Again, I don't want to get too um, detailed in this hour, but you have to make claims. There's a claim section at the end. There's some things that you're, you're asking to be yours. Um, you usually put in up to 50 claims at the end of your patent and then the patent at, at, at the end of your patent application the, the office will come back and say well you're granted claim 179 14 35 50 you know, 48 and 50. that's all we can and then you can go back to them going back and forth back and forth again patent lawyers charge per hour can get very very expensive so prototyping um after you've yourself with a provisional patent or if after you file the utility, utility patent, you have to sort of figure out, well, you know, I've had this idea, it's drawn on paper, you know, can I make a prototype or can I make a model for this? Now, in the books, patenting comes before prototyping, but to be honest with you, um, most times pro prototyping occurs while you're writing up your provisional patent or even before. When you come up with an idea, when we came up with our idea, we started messing around with different things that we had. Um, before we did anything. And once you have your model, it actually makes it easier for you to draw figures and to describe it. So a lot of times prototyping does come right after the idea um, phase. And there's a few different types of prototypes. So the uh, one type of prototype, uh, which is essentially a model, is a structural prototype. And a lot of times we don't have the capability to make a very uh, two scale model or something that actually works, but we can make a model that represents our idea. This is, can be, um, take, you know, cut, you can have raw materials. For example, I'll show you um, our, one of our first provisional, um, uh, one of our first uh, prototypes. You can, you know, go to the store, just get lots of different things from Home Depot. We actually, believe it or not, go to toy stores a lot. So we get different toys that have different mechanical um, features that we can break off and put on different pieces. Um, so, and when I when I visited Merit, who ended up making our product, uh, and we toured their facilities, in their lab there was a bunch of toys, a bunch of you know saws, workbenches. Um, so essentially, you can make a prototype out of raw materials. Nowadays, 3D printing has become a very uh, hot modality for um, modeling. It does get expensive, but there are lots of people that do it for cheap. So it's a very easy to print model. 3D printing is a good idea because um, you can actually get the specs of exactly what you want, which you may not be able to do with makeshift uh, raw materials. Um, 3D printing also allows you to make things to scale or uh, not not to, not the exact size that the final 
product will be, but it could be exactly two times bigger or three times bigger or four times bigger. So you see all the different moving parts to scale. And of course, computer generated models. So um, what my product engineer who happens to be my brother-in-law, he's very good with uh, CAD and he does a lot of our prototyping with computer generated models, um, which can actually be videos that you can show, for example, a balloon inflating and deflating. So it can be a video of how your product actually works and how it changes in between situations. Uh, this is sort of the workbench. Uh, this is what your room should look like if you're in, into this space. On the right here, you'll see, um, so on the right here is actually a balloon inflation device or an insufflator. The device is used to um, inflate and deflate angioplasty balloons. Angioplasty balloons are used to dilate arteries and veins that are narrowed um, or tracts that are narrowed that you know need to be dilated. So for example, if you had a heart attack or provocation in your foot, usually the arteries are very narrowed or occluded. Once you get past the occlusion of the narrowing, the balloon in and the balloon is dilated to open up that artery. To do that you have this device that injects contrast and saline into the balloon catheter and inflates it and deflates it. This is one that Merit Medical makes. It's the most uh, popular one used uh, across the country. It has the highest market share. And you can see that on the bottom, there's a handle that you twist. In the middle, there's that gauge that shows you what pressure you're at. There's a tube at the other end that connects to your balloon catheter. Now, anyone who does a lot of balloon work um, usually at dialysis centers, um, anyone who does a lot of dialysis access work with AD fistulas and AD crafts, you're going to do a lot of ballooning, lots of high pressures to open the veins that are narrowing down. And when I was in, in residency, we actually had an outpatient access center where we did a lot of our venous access, our ports, we did a lot of dialysis work. So we were inflating and deflating all day with that handle on the bottom. Now, the way we came up with the idea was one of my co-residents was covering for me um, while I was interviewing for fellowships and he's a pretty strong guy who actually you know usually goes to the gym and after one one just one day of ballooning up and down up and down up and down he noticed that his wrist was hurting terribly at the end of the day and he said you know this just doesn't make sense to have a twisting torque motion at the at the wrist is there something we can do to sort of fix this um so he came over and asked me like you know like is this volume of dialysis work that dialysis centers typically do. How many dialysis access centers are there? Um, we looked into it and I mean it's a big practice all over the country because lots of people are you know have end stage leukemias and are on dialysis. The incidence of high blood pressure, diabetes and cholesterol is going up that means there's incidence of coronary artery disease, peripheral artery disease, stroke, and end stage renal disease are going up. And that means dialysis is going to go up, especially with baby boomer population. So those access centers are going to be very um, popular in the future. So these procedures are going to need to be done. Um, then we looked at you know, how many of these devices are used um, and things like that and sort of justified our unmet need. The functional, so on the right here, now you see sort of how we tried to change the torque um, on this on the handle where instead of rotating with your wrist, you have to switch the torque to your elbow. Um, and we got the idea from, you know, different things like uh, a fishing pole, a pencil sharpener, or things that have cranks. So things that'll sort of move things up and down or inflate, deflate um, with a crank-like motion instead of a twist-like motion. Um, when we were all in, you know, we learned about simple tools, uh, simple machines like pulleys, um, levers, and cranks. So this is actually a lever. And this is one of our very, very first prototypes where we drilled a hole into the, the handle and then stuck a pen into it and then put that drill bit into the uh, perpendicular to the pen at the end over there and sort of made it into a crank. So like I said, like the original prototypes can be very, uh, you know, raw, very rudimentary. This is actually a functional prototype though. Because a functional prototype is something that actually works but you can't this was actually an inflation device that we just modified. 
Did it, would it work in a patient? Of course it would, but can you use it? No, because it's not sterile. It may not be the, you know, it's real bit in a pen, so it might break. But it is functional. And then the, the last thing, oh, so it is functional. So I'm gonna show you a video here of how, um, this, is a, this is sort of our a third renderation or fourth renderation of prototypes that we made where we took um, a piece from a electric flashlight and we um, sort of welded it to the handle. On the top, you'll see what the way our, our idea compared to the bottom, which is the actual traditional. So you see the bottom, it's a wrist turn, 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 but the top is pretty smooth, pretty simple. Um, and it's more of a smoother transition than the bottom. So the bottom is a very jerky movement, which causes pain at the wrist. It also takes a very long time to inflate and deflate. The last sort of prototype is something called a working prototype. This is a uh, replica of the to scale of the final product. All companies make this. It's um, essentially a non-sterile version of the product, a non-final version of the product. It can be 3D printed and made out of raw materials, but it's essentially exactly like the final product will look. Um, and then there is a, what's called a um, the actual device. So um, some people will actually develop the device, manufacture it, sterilize it, get all the approvals. That's sort of the fourth level of the product. Now, Like I said, the prototyping usually happens before the, the patent writing. And you sort of need a prototype or a model because when you go to somebody describing what, what your idea is, it may be a little bit harder than actually showing them what your idea is. So after we had come up with that last prototype, um, uh, you know, uh, it was me, my, my roommate at the time who uh, went on to Yale to, to get a radiology MBA um, and he's, involved in radiology administration right now. He's sort of our chief operating officer. Um, my engineer is my, uh, who works for us is our uh, chief technological officer. So us three sort of came up with the prototype and uh, had started writing the patent, but we're like, well, what do we do next? And I knew a lot of people that had actually been in this space, um, but before getting them involved, I, I got a good friend of mine, one of my best friends um, who happens to be in, uh, Medical, uh, the medical private equity uh, space to see if he had any idea and um, so asked him for some guidance. And he sort of said what we kind of knew was like, hey, well, you know, you got you to get feedback. Um, are you guys the only guys that think this is a problem? Is this a real problem? Bet out, really bet it out before you put too much time and energy into this. We had decided that we were going to put time and energy into it anyway, just to sort of work the process and to kind of um, just do something, you know, whether or not become something, just do something new, learn something new about device development. Um, but with that said, we had decided that, you know, we have a prototype, we do have a provisional patent, right? Um, but we do have to figure out, you know, is this a good idea or is this a bad idea? When you do this, um, you can get a non-disclosure agreement. You can Google non-disclosure agreements. Um, you'll get a bunch of templates that different companies use. I have so many non-disclosure agreements from so many different companies that I modified over the years. Um, I personally don't use the non, I didn't use a non disclosure in this in our first um, run through because I wanted people to come talk to me. I don't want it to sound so official, especially being the president who's never seen a phone like this before. Um, even sometimes now when we have ideas, I will curbside, you know, my mentors and people that I trust. Um, but I don't, um, I would, I would say, you know, proceed with caution because there are lots of stories that you can and if you Google from the New York Times, certain big medical device companies have taken lots of ideas from doctors, but the doctors can use them to protect themselves because number one, they didn't have a provisional patent file and they didn't have an NDA as well. With that said, an NDA does not mean anything. So you can know lots of people have NDAs and lots of people get screwed over. So um, it is important to be careful and make sure you have someone who's uh, mentoring you and guiding you through this whole process. You can, you know, when you go ask people, you shouldn't, it should be a, a very scientific way, but it should be a method, uh, method, methodology to it. 
what we had done, what you, sh uh, you should do when starting out is there should be a survey. Um, the, the way you approach uh, the market research is you should, it should be a survey format so that you can actually collect data. Um, a lot of questions should be direct so that you can generate graphs and data so you can get a better idea of what, um, you know, what metrics you've actually met and what metrics you need to meet. And then you should also have an open-ended um, format towards the end so that you, know, you may get a better idea from another person that you may ask. So what, one or two of your mentors or someone you may know might just jot down something like, oh, maybe I can incorporate this into my, um, my idea. And medical device companies do this all the time with doctors, whether or not they have a conscience of day agreements. So like I said, it's done on a larger scale by medical device companies every single day, uh, every time there's a new thing out. For example, we did a bunch of pulmonary embolism, uh, pharmacopoeic mechanical bronchitis this week with the new member lightning device, and so many different um, questions were asked to us um, just on a casual basis. Um, we deployed a Venus stent today that's a, uh, a newer one on the market uh, from by Boston Scientific, and um, I was talking to the rep, and we said, you know, the deployment is actually pretty shaky. So it's just, you know, free sort of consulting that we gave them, and we might get that for free. Um, like I said, make sure you do have it in the survey format because when you do go to the bigger companies or you do have the data, talking data, people are ready to listen. So you can say, um, you know, even when you watch a commercial, you know, seven out of eight, eight dentists prefer Sensodyne. That's something that they've done. They did some sort of market research and they got, you know, maybe 7,000 out of 8,000. They tell you seven out of eight. So you want that kind of data to present to people that um, you want to convince that this is actually a good idea and your product may be of value. This is where I uh, limit my, where my, me and my company's uh, limitations are sort of uh, met. Um, we do not do anything further than what I've described to you now. Um, we may go down that route where we will actually develop a working prototype or even a uh, an actual device by getting um, third-party companies out there to manufacture it for us. That gets a little tricky and a little expensive, um, but we're sort of ironing all that out right now. We may actually also go down the path of filing utility patents for some of the ideas we have. But like I said, utility patent can cost you know anywhere from fifty to a hundred thousand. A real prototype, like a working prototype, can cost up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars to make. And then um, actually developing or manufacturing something. Um, I'll show you the device that we ended up making. Merit Medical actually ended up putting about $3 million into getting that device uh, off the ground. So you need a lot of investment. Um, you can go out and get investors. I do know a lot of people that have done done whole you know, process from start to finish. If you know about the sniper catheter, uh, the little micro catheter, those guys, you know, made that from scratch, the Inari um, from back to me device is sort of the same story, but these guys have lots of money, lots of investors, and their primary goal, even their physicians, the chief medical officer in the physician group, was to get this device off the ground, and they weren't really working. Um, and for most of us, that's not you know, something we can do. So the other route you can take is the route that we took, and it's getting a licensing agreement. You go to um, one of these companies, we went to Merit Medical. I would recommend going to a smaller or a medium sized company um, rather than a big company. Big companies have resources and they really don't tend, they forget you know, what, where they came from, where they started from, and don't tend to work with doctors that much. They will work with the doctors that are very technically or um, uh, sort of, you know, doctors who have an engineering background that are very technical or, or experts in the field may not entertain people that are just starting out and young physicians are even trained in this field. Smaller medical device companies may not have resources to um, expand their R&D, but medium-sized companies, all of which are listed here except for probably Bard, Cook, and Boston Scientific. Um, so Merit Medical, Angel Dynamics, and a number of sort of medium-sized companies that are working with doctors every single day to sort of come up with new ideas. Um, so you can go to them and say, I have an idea, and They'll send you over an NDA, send over a slide deck with everything that you have, sort of your, why is it an unmet need, um, 
data supporting, you know, it, it could be from the literature as well, you know, hey, this is a problem and we fixed it. Um, here's our here's some designs that we came up with. Here's a prototype. This is what the market looks like. This is how many devices are used over here. This is why we think our modification or this new device will make a difference. And here's the questions. So that, that slide deck, um, my answer officer or my, you know, best friend to healthcare private equity space it's now actually the device as private equity firm um, he sort of does the most of the slide decks because he's this is day and night um, and he does a lot of the assessments of the market and how many devices are sold and what the profit margins are and stuff like that however medical device companies will do that part for you so you don't really have to worry we'll actually give you a lot of resources but be surprised people are out there um, so they'll do that work. Um, but so again, the ultimate goal in my pathway was to get a licensing agreement where they, you know, give you some money up front to sort of help you with costs. Um, you'll have some some legal costs and stuff like that, and you know, to get you off the ground running. And then they'll work out some sort of royalty deal, or if they just really like it, they'll give you a huge lump sum right off the bat, just saying, here, let, let us take this off your hands. Every in every sort of um, pillar, the more advanced you are, the better deal you're going to get. So, for example, if you have a utility patent, it's going to be worth way more than having a provisional patent. It can be a better deal. If you have a functional prototype or working prototype, that's going to be way more valuable to a device company than just having a model because to a model, you really have to do a lot of the work. And you come up with a licensing agreement. Um, I'm going to sort of cut it off here and I'm going to finish this my story because um, I don't want to get to the nitty gritty of it. So, yeah, I can talk about this topic for hours and hours and hours. If you look at the top slide here, on the left is the product from the basics, um, the basic information device, the very basic compact, and it's called the compact because it's small. And then on the right side of the screen, it's called the basics tau, and tau stands for fork. So you can see the handle actually flips open, and a little um, perpendicular part flips out of that part, and then you can see the elbow and crank up and down. Um, flip open. The good thing about my idea or our design is that once you close it, um, you can actually close it and use it the regular way as well, so people don't like. Um, the crank and they think it's unstable, which some people do. Um, some people don't like using that feature. You don't have to use that. So, um, and that's actually a picture of the device. We have it on the shelf at in our hospital. We use it in our lab every day or every time we enter the So, um, so the sort of the end of my story. After we had sort of the concept, I went to. I was a resident in New York City at the time. Um, academic program there, two connections that I've had, I had, got a lot of data, then approached a, a few people, Aaron Fishman being one of them, and then my mentor when I was in medical school, and my previous boss, would actually develop a needle with uh, Merit Medical for a single issue um, Aaron Fishman uh, has a lot of radial access stuff with uh, Merit Medical, and they introduced there and Merit Medical at the time was a medium sized company. Now they're a lot bigger. Um, and their CEO is very involved. He's very involved in product development. He's actually a salesman, he's not an engineer, he's not a doctor, he's not a finance guy. He's a salesman, he's a salesman back in the 70s. He was selling hypodermic needles. He bought a small company and just, you know, met up with doctors and stuff, making things like syringes and stuff. Merit is one of the lead, uh, leaders in syringes, three-way stopcock, small things. And now they even have all the way up to, you know, um, radio frequency ablation devices for um, AV nodal displays. So the CEO, Fred Lampropoulos, is a really good guy. He actually flew me out. Uh, he was the, um, sort of the brains behind the first ablation device. That was one of his babies favorite devices makes them a lot of money, makes them about $100 million a year because they do have a market 
share. And it was, all, it was a good idea, but all, it was also good timing because their patent is expiring. So we need to file for some extensions, especially overseas in China. Um, but there's a lot of knockoffs that are already produced in China and, and a lot of the money. Um, and this is where the price gets very complicated. A lot of the revenues actually dependent on lawsuits overseas. Um, so they wanted to sort of capture some of that revenue and they uh, flew out to Utah to show, uh, show for um, I said, you know, we love your idea. Let us think about it. Let, let my engineers sort of um, sleep on it. They took all of our prototypes. Um, this was back by August of my third year. Fast forward to January. Um, Stride's daughter, student at Columbia, for undergrad. So he flew over, called me, and uh, we the chief operating officer now, um, to meet in the hotel lobby of his uh, for where he was staying. So we thought, you know, this is it. It's over. It's, it's a good idea, but tell me it's going to go uh, Shows up, shows a working prototype. Um, so similar to the, the picture you see here, but it was a little bit different. Um, so I think we love the idea. Of the uh, we were very eager, eager to start, sign the deal, and we had looked at all of our um, residency requirements. So this is one, uh, and I'm going a little bit uh, when you are medical students and or, or radiology residents or even an attending like at my level you are in academics and even if you're in private practice one thing you must know is like your uh, ideas are their ideas and you don't own anything intellectual property is not yours we had actually contacted somebody in our compliance department who sent us an email saying oh yeah don't worry about it go ahead do whatever you guys want we thought that would have been enough Unfortunately, Merritt had actually been involved in a situation with uh, where I was a resident and went on to being a fellow um, at Mount Sinai. And uh, things got ugly for a while. Um, the biodesign group at uh, Sinai actually wanted to um, take over the project. There were a lot of uh, who's going to do what. Um, they were very you know, grateful and very. Uh, Sort of proud of what we had accomplished, but we didn't want to take over what we did. They are more into drugs in the pharma pharmacology space, where they do produce a lot of drugs and have a lot of great deals. They really aren't in the medical device space that much. They did have a very prolific cardiologist, or yeah, cardiologist, certain that have done some stuff. Um, and then so it, it, it did take a lot of legal fees and us going back and forth. We got lucky in some ways offline about um, how to go about doing this but at the end of the day everyone sort of agreed um that we should you know just turn this over to merit you know they're not going to be able to do anything we're going to be able to do anything and a few days before our original patent was going to expire we signed a, a deal um fast forward to i was a fellow they launched a sir that year um when i was at sir i got to showcase it to a bunch of physicians and a bunch of friends following year was on the market. This year, um, COVID hit and the inflation price is more expensive than the other one. And it was supposed to be linked to another product and they were gonna sell a bunch of it. They said they were going back on that. So am I seeing a bunch of royalties and quitting my job? No, practically nothing. So even though I made it to the end uh, and yeah, there's a bunch of, you know, maybe a handful of labs in the country that use it. Most people don't even know that this exists. Like I said, just like most people don't know, so many patents exist. Um, but with that said, like the three great things that I've learned were um, invaluable and like stayed with us. Um, one thing I will tell you is when you ask people for help, believe it or not, they're way more than willing to give it to you. We called people that were very, very high up at different device companies, many lawyers you know, to get curbside advice. You know, lawyers that people have knew or you know, through contacts, um, we called people at the Biodesign Fellowship at Stanford, and we got a lot of advice, um, pretty much free. And now we have about, I think, about seven or eight more provisional patents that are sitting there. Um, a couple of deals have fell through, but we have some exciting things coming up in the radio access space, um, in some drainage catheters, and again, so hopefully, a couple of different, you know, one of the many companies will pick up. Um, and one thing that may actually end up going into some 
phase one testing. Um, what I didn't talk about here again was, you know, did my device need FDA approval? No, um, lots of things that, you know, don't really change the outcomes in patients don't require that. They require like a small product 10K. Um, application and approval was expedited. Again, we can get into all the nitty gritty. Uh, the bio design book really tells you all of this, but you should actually work with people that you know, ask people for medical device company to guide you as well. Um, with that said, uh, I hope everybody enjoyed my talk. I hope it was informative. Um, I hope, you know, if you guys have ideas, definitely act on it. You know, um, go hear people say, you know, I wish there was this, I wish there was that. Um, you know, this will just keep, it keeps sort of day-to-day -day interesting. I mean, every day I have, all my cool cases and I have um, all the research I'm doing. And this is just something else that kind of keeps you know, IR fun. IR is like interesting and fun to begin with, but it's sort of different. So if you're into technology, you're into, um, you know, making things easier um, and coming out with new things and, you know, definitely um, go for it because it, it is possible. And I know many doctors that have developed insane devices um, and have, you know, are worth hundreds and hundreds of millions dollars just from an idea that they had. So uh, with that said, I'll, you know, I know Frank ran over a bit, but I'll over to the questions. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Shukla, for the great talk. Um, we have a couple of questions and a lot of thank yous. Um, so the first question we have is, how many ideas have you taken all the way to the licensing stage? And can you speak to the profitability so far? Did it meet your expectations? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so this is the only, oh, to the licensing phase, we've taken one additional product, but I mean, that product doesn't exist. So we got into the licensing phase, but the company didn't do anything with it. So that's the other thing um, you gotta kind of be careful about is, Let's say you come up with an idea, a device company may give you a licensing agreement. They don't want you to take it to anybody else. They shelf it. That's not the reason this particular device got shelved. It was just like, you know, the device company actually gave us back the uh, the rights to the product. Um, they just, like, again, it was sort of around COVID. They got, um, they just went into a different direction. Each company has hundreds and hundreds of ideas. And they, you, know, you can see they have like these idea boards and they kind of like something down. Um, when I, I routinely go to Merit and, and I, I don't have any consulting agreement with them all, but sort of um, pitching on different ideas. They will have, they'll shelf something. Um, I've seen some stuff that I thought was absolutely ridiculous and they thought it was a great idea. They actually have a prototype and everything working. They're like, oh, I'm like, no, we just can't for these reasons. They go back and they tell me six months later, like, you're right, that was actually not a bad idea. So I've only taken one other idea to licensing. Um, and the other reason that we have, so I do have a bunch of patents that are just kind of sitting there and a few reasons. So one, I became an attending. So the first year of attending will be the first year of your career. Um, you gotta kind of learn, I mean, a fellow, you do a lot of crazy stuff, but you never really have a, have a responsibility. Um, you learn responsibility in your first year as an attending. You learn when to push the envelope, when not to. Um, you have to really you're the new guy, so you have to stay late, um, do all the cases, you know, clean up. Um, also, I'm very academic, so I want to you know, produce a lot in my first year. So we sort of started, launched our, lab, our research lab. Uh, Dr. Kumar was one of my partners in that. Um, tried to be the last few years, so we kind of slowed down there. My partner is also, um, the, my company is only four people. Um, my, Engineer, he you know got involved in um, sort of work as well. Got really busy. Uh, my CFO, who happens to be my best friend, ended up taking a job in Chicago. Was like, like I said, he's a VP of uh, the medical device division of the private equity firm. He works, you know, like ten hours a week, so he's really really busy. Um, and then my uh, co-resident, he's, uh, he's actually um, assistant professor at Yale now. He's an emergency radiologist. Um, he's getting involved in. Uh, more hospital administration. He's actually launching a couple of cool startups with his friends um, and his, and his uh, brothers and his cousins. So we kind of got you know, everyone kind of got involved in this. Um, but we sort of revamped post COVID. 
um, after we got ownership of some stuff back, once you disclose to a company, and this is all like who owns once an idea is out in the public, you can't say you own it anymore. Um, so once you disclose to a company, it's actually making the idea public. You've got to go through a lot of stuff to get the idea back. Luckily, I mean, Merit is awesome. They work so well with physician movies, got some rights to a lot of stuff back. Even though they developed a bunch of the technology based on our ideas and our models, they just handed it over to us and say, hey, you know, hey, good luck. And I'm actually working on the process of presenting uh, one of our patents on some radial stuff to um, Portis. I have another, some dealings with Cook. Um, so hopefully in a few years, maybe we'll get another thing on the shelf. As far as profitability, so I, I haven't made anything, not much. And this gets into like, how do you get paid? This is sort of like a talk in its own, but to keep it like short, one, uh, one uh, thing is the way we, uh, so you have to sort of have a company that I'll see as cold or something like that. So the money comes into the company pay tax on that and then when you get dividends you have to get paid taxes on that as well we i personally never funded anything but i had paid tax because we make 100 200 bucks a quarter um the royalty agreement that we had was up front we actually got to close the deal um we got a hundred thousand dollars um and that's mostly because they wanted to extend the patent um most likely usually you don't get that money up front. i do know people that have and when we had the provisional patent and we had a functional prototype, a good friend of mine has had a utility patent to uh, sign his uh, to do the deal. Got paid two million dollars. So that's what a utility patent's for. Um, and I know people that have manufactured went all the way to like very high level manufacturing um, that have also gotten initial payments that were pretty high. On the back end, uh, like I said, Merit Medical put in about two point five million dollars to making this device. So for every device that's sold, that's pretty much it. Um, it's not much. Uh, any where I work, I can't get it because it's hard well, or anywhere I have worked, since mine I use it, Rutgers uses it, Rutgers uses it, Rutgers uses it, I can't get paid. I see about, you know, about, I don't know, 500, a couple hundred bucks every quarter. They haven't pushed it. So profitability, so the amount of time that we've placed, it's not a lot. Of that 100 grand, by the way, like uh, 20, uh, I'm sorry, 35, 34, 35 grand went to Mount Sinai. So Mount Sinai actually owns 35% of this. Um, they wanted 80. So this is where the whole school thing comes in. And again, we can talk about that off, offline. Um, another 25 went into lawyer fees. Um, so at the end of the day, we ended up with pretty much nothing. And we just kind of keep the LLC going and funding ideas. So profitability wise, it's not I mean, I mean, but uh, there are stories of people out there that have made a lot. And I personally know people. Bob Rosen made a lot of money. Um, Keith Haskell made a lot of money. I'm just not there yet. Um, if you have a slam dunk idea and you have the skills or the money to develop it, I mean, this guy's the one. Great, that was super informative. Thank you again, Dr. Shukla. Um, I think that's all the questions we have for now. Um, if you have any more questions for Dr. Shukla, um, you should definitely connect with him on social media. Um, his handle is on the slide right now. Um, but I think that just about wraps it up for our webinar tonight. Um, I think Hudson will be sending out a post post webinar survey, so we definitely encourage you to take that. And thank you again for coming out tonight. Thanks, everybody.